wardrobe malfunction with the tie. <laughs> um, real quick here, let's go ahead and stand if, if you're able to do so, and we'll read our memory verses. <coughs> because we do start our new series today, and that is in the Psalms. Uh, selections from the Psalms. And uh, just to have a few here from Psalm 1, which we'll also be looking at. So read this with me, please. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You may be seated. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design masterfully used metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience, to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelites, sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection, the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story, and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle, and then later the temple in Jerusalem, were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals, you'd hear songs and prayers, all of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain, and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence, and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. And so try to imagine how dramatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles, designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's been placed a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden and temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms, and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope, about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah, or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful, but who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis. After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh right, a future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, 
hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets. And they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the Book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. This isn't the kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah summary of the book of Psalms and part of what it was for. And of course there's much more to it uh, than that. But that gives kind of an overview of some of those things and some things that we'll do a review on again here in just a few minutes as we begin this series. But uh, we do begin, uh, like I said, a new series called Selections from the Psalms. Now we cannot go through every psalm. The 150. Um, that'd be nice, but that would be about 97 by the time we finished. <laughs> and there's a lot more in Scripture, of course, but each one is wonderful and great. And I would recommend that you uh, do your own study on the Psalms, too, by the way. But today we're going to look at the introduction, a little overview of what the Psalms are, and then we will look at, take a brief look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1. So we'll look at uh, this different genre, a different style of writing than what Paul's letter was to the Philippians. Now, the content and context of this collection, of course, as you just saw, prayers, songs, uh, laments, praises uh, from the ancient Jewish world, the ancient Israelites. And this is one of the most studied books of the Bible, and probably the most studied book of the Old Testament, uh, next to maybe Genesis and Isaiah, although probably Psalms is a little bit more. Uh, you can actually find every emotion in the Psalms. Uh, joy. Deep sorrow, discouragement, uh, praise, anger, and much, much more. So first we'll look a little bit at the background of the Psalms. Again, we always want to look at the context of the book that we're going to be studying. Now, in the ancient Near East, many cultures, like the Akkadians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, would write prayers and praises to their deities. Uh, these were, it was very common. Of course, only the Psalms is inspired by God. Uh, but this book was, again, the book of prayers and praises for the Israelites, uh, both pre-exile and post-exile. The English word comes from the Greek word psalmos, which is taken from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and that's where we get the word psalms from. The book was actually written over a 1,000-year period. Think about that. 1,000 years, starting about 1450 to about 400 B.C. Moses was the first to write a psalm. Uh, he wrote Psalm 90. And, of course, others were Asaph, uh, Solomon, the sons of Korah, uh, King David, of course, and he wrote about half of them. And some we have no name attributed to them. So it could have been David, maybe someone else. The book was finalized probably by Ezra's time, uh, around the early 400s, because they were still being written. So you know what you want to include what God has said so in these in this book so that's what happened. And as you saw in the video, it's set up in five books, set up in five different books. And Kevin, I may need your help with this thing here in a second too because it's still kind of flaky. Um, whoop, sorry. It's all good. No worries. Uh, book one, Psalm one through forty-one. Book two is forty-two through seventy-two. Three, four, and five. You can see that up and so on. And a lot of people ask, well, why five books? Well, it mimics the five books of Moses. It mimics the five books. And actually, there is some parallels there. You can do your own study on that. And <clears throat> me. each book concludes with a worship or praise or doxology to God. You know, oh, Lord, we praise you. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Each book concludes with that. Uh, books one and two are mainly about David, as you saw. Book three were mostly written by Asaph and the sons of Korah. Four and five were a lot of anonymous psalms. 
but throughout, the focus is the God of Israel, Yahweh. He is the focus of the book of Psalms. Also, there are various kinds of psalms, and Kevin, I need your help with that. Sorry about that. It's okay. And here's just a few. There's the royal psalms, the royal psalms. Uh, these focus on God as king. Uh, they also point to Jesus as the coming king, the Messiah, and celebrate the king of Israel. Uh, these were actually read when a new king was put into place. And we'll see that more really next week when we study Psalm 2, which is one of the royal psalms and also a messianic psalm. There are also the Psalms of Zion. And you say, well, what is Zion? Well, it's Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. Uh, they're about Jerusalem, about the temple where God was worshipped. And Psalm 122 is one example of those. Then there's the penitential psalm. You say, what is penitential? Repentance. Repentance. Uh, psalms of repentance. These could be corporate or they could be individual. Uh, one is Psalm 51, which is David's repentance. And we'll look at that one. There are wisdom psalms. Now this is a contrast between the wicked and the righteous, which is common in wisdom <laughs> literature. Now of course the psalms are part of poetry and they kind of mix in with the wisdom literature. So a lot of them do that as we'll see today. Uh, psalm 49 is one example of wisdom psalms. And there's a few subcategories, Torah, creation, and history. Torah psalms, and you can guess, specifically focus on the beauty of and the truth of God's law. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible is about that. There's a creation psalms. Psalm 19, that extol or exalt God as the creator. The heavens declare the glory of God. Again, Psalm 19. And next are the history psalms. History psalms. Say, what is that? Well, this reminds the readers and the listeners of Israel's history where they came from, where they've come to, God's faithfulness, even God's judgment for sin. And they call the people to recommit to the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 78 is one example of those. Then we have the imprecatory psalms. Who's ever heard of the imprecatory psalms? A few people have. Uh, these psalms call for God to judge the enemies of Israel. Lord, dash them to pieces! And Psalm 137 is, is one example. And these are actually... Kind of difficult sometimes for us to study because in our mind they seem to conflict or contradict uh, other biblical passages you know well what about loving your enemies well it's, it's different than that and we'll look at that then there are praise or celebration psalms psalm 117 is one example of those basically they praise god for who he is for his character for his work among his people for his deliverance and his faithfulness and some of these psalms were designed to be sung or read by the congregation. Uh, also in response, some of these, the, the Levites would sing one part, the people would sing another part. It's very interesting how these things worked out. Another group, the Messianic psalms. The Messianic psalms. These were important, of course, when they were written, but they had a very special way of pointing forward to the Messiah. Again, I mentioned Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 is another one, which we'll look at. And so we're going to study a variety of psalms in this series. And of course, I remind you, they were sung. And before we go on, I want us to think of something. Singing is a teaching tool. Singing is a teaching tool. When I was in Japan, um, the curriculum that we used used songs to teach the kids. You know, A, B, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H I J K L M N O P. See, and you remember why? Because there's a tune to it. You know, row, row, row your boat. Gently down the street. Gently down. Exactly. It, it, it's singing is a teaching tool, and it helps us to remember certain things. Let me ask you this: Is there a commercial that you remember from 20 years ago that you cannot get out of your head? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you have trouble remembering what you did last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is that? Because there's a tune set to that phrase. Singing is a teaching tool, and this is where we need to be very careful and be very aware of what we sing in the church. Most people get their theology from music rather than the Bible. I mentioned that before. So think about what you sing. 
Think about the songs that you sing. Think about the lyrics you sing. And just because something sounds nice or may have some kind of biblical reference doesn't mean it's biblical. So be aware of that. And today, Christian music has become very popular. And many of the old hymns have some great theology. Some of them, not so good theology. Some of the newer stuff, some of it has great theology. And some of it has very bad and even heretical theology. And one thing I encourage you to do, learn about the individual or the group who is singing. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. Because guess what? Their theology is in their music. Good or bad. Um, so in, even if it's popular around the world, it could be wrong. So be very careful with that. Get your theology from the Bible to protect you and to give you a reason to praise the Lord and to understand what he's done for you in Christ. Then we can sing those songs. Then we can praise him. Then we can understand who he is. So be wise and be discerning. Also, songs are poetic literature. You say, well, what is poetic literature? Well, it's, again, it's a different style of genre. Words are used to paint a picture. That's poetry. There are specific rules of interpretation also for poetic literature, which we'll look at. And Hebrew poetry did not use the rhyme the way we do. You know, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and... So are you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> they didn't use it that way. Hebrew poetry did have rhyme and rhythm. But it used what is called parallelism. Parallelism. You say, well, what is that? Well, that's just a way that they would write. One form of parallelism was comparison. Comparison. This is the repetition of the first line in the second. Uh, maybe in a different way, but it was done to emphasize a specific point. Let me give you an example here. Psalm 105, verses 1 and 2. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Let's give thanks to him. Sing praises to him. There's even parallelism in that own verse. Tell all of his wondrous works. And make known his deeds among the peoples. It's the same thing, just said in a different way. That's Hebrew parallelism. That's the comparison. But there's another form. Contrast. Contrast. The first line says something. The second line says something the opposite. Example. Psalm 73, verse 28. My flesh and my heart may fail. And we can all attest to that, by the way. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So there's a contrast. Mm -hmm. Me and my flesh and its weakness. God and his strength forever. So a contrast. So comparison and contrast. Also, <coughs> Hebrew poetry sometimes use their own alphabet in their poems. Psalm 119 is an example of that. Each different area is a separate letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It goes in order. And it was, again, done as a teaching tool. Done as a teaching tool. <coughs> Excuse me. I know the Psalms were written to be read, to be sung. <coughs> but also, we need to remember, these were written under the Mosaic Law. They were under the law when they wrote this. So some of the references, some of the allusions, not illusions, but allusions, are to God's law and to his covenant faithfulness in that law. Uh, while there's application, we do need to be aware of this and be careful how we apply some of these things. And last, there are some notations in the Psalms that we may not fully understand what they are, like the word selah. Now, most think that's some kind of musical reference, and it probably is, but there's a lot of words that, you know, it's like, well, what, you know, a miktam. A what, what is that? I mean, what, what is, what, we, we don't fully know what these words mean sometimes because, again, the world is, the words have changed and we don't understand that. But nevertheless, these were inspired by God. And He gave them to us. And He gave them to us also to learn from. So, with that little bit of a background, let's please stand as we read Psalm 1. As we read Psalm 1. Very short, only six verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Verses 1 and 2, those are memory verses. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all 
that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You may be seated. Let's have a quick prayer before. Again, our Father, our Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Psalms. Thank you for this new series. And I pray, Lord, it's a blessing to all of us as we study your word, as we learn more about you and who you are. So teach us this day. Fill us with your spirit. For your glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So that is Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Now, as we look at this, Again, I want you to remember a few things. Everything in the Old Testament was measured by God's law. The people, the nation, everything and everyone. And that's important to keep in mind because, again, that is the context in which these were written. So we will see a lot of references to these things as we go through. <coughs> Excuse me. And this first psalm sets up the entire book. Psalms 1 and 2 set up the entire book. Uh, we see this contrast between the righteous man and the wicked man. This was very common in Jewish wisdom literature, again, by the way. And it defines who the righteous are under the law. Because, again, everything was measured by that. So let's start looking at this. Verses 1 through 3. The righteous. The righteous. Blessed. That's the first word that we read. Now, we actually went over this in our uh, series on Wednesday nights called Defining Christianese. We talked about what the word blessed means, uh, a word that we often use. And there is a sense of happiness to it. There really is a lot more to it than that. The blessed man of God is the recipient of his goodness, his grace, uh, the life and has a fruitful relationship with him. In contrast to that, the cursed man, under the Mosaic law, was the recipient of God's judgment and wrath resulting in death. So you have life and you have death. In summary, the blessed man had God's life. The cursed man was under God's judgment. So there's the, 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 the two individuals, as it were, that we see here. And here the blessed man is a picture of a righteous individual. And he did not do three things. He did those three things. And they actually parallel each other and, again, are a teaching tool. And we see first the words wicked, sinners, and scoffers. Let's look, just talk a little bit about this for a second. They're parallel words. They have very similar meaning, but some slightly different nuances. You can study that in your own time. But this is a description of a specific kind of person, the wicked, the sinner, the scoffer. This individual turns away from God, turns away from his covenant, and wants nothing to do with God, and he becomes a fool in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. The fool in the eyes of God is not one who lacks an intellect, not lacking intelligence, but because he wants nothing to do with God, he's a fool. He's a foolish individual. He says, no, God. I don't want you, I don't want your way, I don't want your word, I want to do it my way. And God says, that person's a fool. No matter how many degrees they have, no matter how many years they've been in school, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they are, no matter their state in life, someone who rejects God, according to him, is a fool. This individual despises discipline, he despises correction. And you find that in wisdom literature and Proverbs and more. You know, the fool does not like to be disciplined. You know, it's like that stubborn animal. <laughs> you know, they don't like that discipline. They want to do it their own way, which is very sad. This individual will never learn. And some of us may know some people like that. And it breaks your heart because you continually seem to make bad decisions in life. And you think, why don't you ever learn? Don't you get it? Why don't you remember? Why don't you understand? But that's the fool. In contrast is the righteous. And this individual will not walk, stand, or sit in their ungodly ways. Now, here we have three steps into foolishness. 
Three steps into foolishness. This blessed man will not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That is, he will not join in a conversation with the wicked or walk with them listening to what they say and taking it to heart. Because once a person walks in the counsel of the wicked, they stand in the way of sinners. Now this standing in the way doesn't mean, oh, excuse me, you're in my way. That doesn't mean that. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. When we stop walking and stand with someone in a conversation, the conversation gets more serious. Think about that. You're at a party, maybe a, a, a business function. You stand with someone talking to them face to face. Hello, my name is. You know, who are you? What do you do? It's, it's a conversation that you're, you, know, you want to learn about this person. And in this context, this is not just a dialogue, but an agreement with the other individual. And the word for way, by the way, can be translated path or pathway. There's a pathway that someone's going down. There is a way that someone is taking. And this is a reference to the lifestyle of the sinner and what he or she is involved in. So once you stand, then the last step down to foolishness is sitting in the seat of scoffers. Sitting in the seat of scoffers. When you sit down with a fool, we fall into their trap. And these three steps are in this verse. And it's still a good warning for us. And I really like the way the Net Bible writes this. It's got a good note on this. <coughs> Let me read that to you in a second. The sequence, walk, stand, sit, envisions a progression from relatively casual, you know, association with the wicked to complete identification with them. Wow. Does that speak to our world today or what? Mm -hmm. This is a warning for us too. Now this does not mean we can't talk to a sinner. Of course, that, that's not what this is a reference to. You know, we should be tell, talking to the people in the world. But it's a warning about whom we associate with and with whom we get our advice from. So my question is, where do you get your advice from? Who do you get it from? And do we get it from the world or from the word? Stark contrast. And I would say that, particularly for those who are watching and for those of us here, youth, teenagers, and young adults really need to take this to heart. Mm -hmm. Be very careful where you get your advice from. Yeah. You know, you may have a, a good friend who doesn't know Christ. You know that he or she just doesn't do things the right way. And they say, you know what? That person hurts you. you got to get revenge. you got to get them back. Ugh. It's not a good friend. It's not a good friend. Or you may have a friend who's a professing Christian. Maybe even goes to your church. But, you know, this individual is not really living the way the Lord wants him or her to. You know, they're sexually promiscuous. You know, they cheat on their schoolwork, on their tests or something like that. And you go to him or her for advice and you realize, well, this person looks more like Hollywood than they do what Scripture wants us to be. And you get your counsel from that person, you're asking for trouble too. If we get our counsel from the world, we're actually getting counsel from Satan himself because he's the one running the world. Amen. So be careful about that. And also be careful about mixing God's word with worldly wisdom. It happens all the time. Doesn't mean we can't learn. Doesn't mean there's nothing good. All truth is God's truth. But we need to get our counsel from God's word and from those who are truly following him as best as they can. So be careful. Now, this righteous one delights in God's law, his Torah, his teaching, his instruction. He gets God's direction for his life. Now, the word for delight here I think is really cool. It refers to delight, pleasure, uh, longing for. Wow, that's a, such a good picture. This person takes pleasure in the law of God. He longs for the law of God. David said that in Psalm 40, verse 8. You know, I long for your law. Which, by the way, Psalm 40 is also a messianic psalm. So rather than listening to the counsel of the ungodly, this person delights or meditates on God's law. Now, the word meditate is really different than it used to be in the world. Uh, today we have this 
image of someone sitting on the floor with their legs crossed, their hands in some kind of position with their eyes closed, and then humming or saying a word over and over again. That is not the biblical definition at all. Here, meditates is actually the Hebrew word hagah, which can have different meanings, growling, declaring, devising, making sound, murmuring, or to muse. I like the word to muse. What does muse mean? Well, it means to think deeply or ponder about something. Ponder. You ever heard the word amusement? You know, we're in Orlando, the amusement park capital of the world. Well, what does amusement mean? It means not to think. A, uh, A, at the beginning of a word, cancels that word. So amuse means don't think. Hmm. So if you've ever worked in a theme park, which I have, you see a lot of people not thinking, walking around. <laughs> Believe me. And I've been there myself, like, okay, where am I going? I don't know. Where's the map? Where? Been there, done that. I did, I did so... But amusement means not to think. And that's what entertainment actually is for today. So be aware of that. You know, as one who works in entertainment, they don't want you to think. <laughs> Trust me on that. They want you to believe what is, what is given to you. But this individual meditates or thinks deeply on God's truth. Day and night, all the time. It's a habit. It's a pattern of this person's life. And that, of course, is something we can learn from. There's definitely an application for us. You know, we're under grace, not under law. But are we learning God's word? Even Genesis to Deuteronomy. Very important. Do we really have scripture on our mind? Do we memorize Bible verses? This is a challenge for me. This is one area where I'm very weak, and I'll confess that to you. But really, the only way to do it is to do it. Make the decision and discipline oneself to actually do it. It's like anything else. You know, do we think about God? Do we think about his word often during the day? You say, well, what do I do? Well, again, many times I fail at this, but think about, you know, read, read Psalm 1 every day this week. Think about one verse from it each day. That's one way to do it, and to get started in that. So, with that, verse 3 now. Verse 3. <clears throat> hmm? Break it again? I had the right one. Right. <laughs> verse 3. We see the word like. Now, for those who are English individuals or have studied literature, you know this is a word for a figure of speech called a simile. Simile. It means a comparison. You know, like or as. You know, that's, that's how it's used. Um, yeah, he is as strong as an ox. Well, is the person an ox? No. He's strong, and we're using the illustration of that. Uh, how about this one? The pillow I sleep on is like a fluffy cloud. Ooh. That would be nice. <laughs> but we know that we're not literally sleeping on a fluffy cloud, because if we did, we'd fall through it, and we'd end up dead. Gravity, Gravity takes over. These are figures of speech. And this individual who thinks on God's word, thinks on God's law, is like a tree. He's planted by the streams of water. What a picture. Parts of Israel are a desert. They are a desert. So there are fertile places too. But when it's hot, rainy season has ended, you want water. Water is more precious than gold. And this individual is planted by rivers of running water, fresh water. Now this person is not a shrub, not a plant, not a small plant, or even a flower, but a tree. A tree. And this tree has an abundant water supply from different streams. She's healthy, strong, will not die from lack of sustenance. And you know what? When that storm comes, it won't be destroyed. It won't be destroyed. This tree has deep roots that go into these streams to get that sustenance from. And these streams are a picture of God's word, God's law. The truth of God here is pictured as pure 
water to refresh the soul, to give someone strength, to give someone help, to give someone hope in life, to give someone strength for the journey. And this tree is healthy and produces fruit. It's a fruit tree. When someone meditates on God's law, there's fruit in his or her life, which comes at the appropriate season. You know, if you go anywhere around the world, there's fruitful seasons, you know. You know, sometimes peaches are in season, sometimes strawberries are in season, sometimes pineapples are in season. It's kind of hard to decide that whenever it's here in Florida because you know, we have so much fruit and everything in the store. I never know what season it is until the fruit starts going up in price. And I think, oh, okay, it's not strawberry season. It's like $5 for this much. You know, it's obviously not the season for strawberries. But when it's season, you know, the prices go down because there's an abundance and this individual has an abundance of fruit in his or her life. In context, again, studying God's law. For us, studying God's word. There's fruit in our lives. And there should be fruit in our lives. When we apply what God says, when we do what he says, even when it's hard, we can be like that firm tree planted. Being watered, being healthy, dependent upon the Lord. But what fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. We'll be in our lives along with holiness, righteousness, compassion, strength, help, hope. And when those storms come, and they will, they will come. Hurricanes will come. Tsunamis will come. We will be planted firmly, not in our own strength, not in our opinions or our traditions, but in what God says himself in his word. So, what fruit is there in our lives? I have to ask that question. Is there fruit in our lives? If there's not, there's a problem. There's a problem. Now, sometimes it'll be more pronounced than others. Sometimes, you know, when we're really getting into the Word of God and He's changing us, you know, we'll see a lot more fruit than we would at other times. But is there fruit? There should be. <clears throat> because if we profess to be a Christian and there's no fruit, we're probably not a Christian. That's what God's Word says. Now, people grow at different rates, I understand that. And some people will notice the fruit before we will. Hey, there's been such a change in your life. You know, you don't, you don't, don't swear like you used to. You know, you don't do this. You know, you don't, you, you're not so angry anymore. Oh, wow, well, yeah. That's the grace of God and his work in my life. That's the fruit. That's the fruit. This person is blessed by God for obeying his law. In all he does, he prospers or is blessed. Now, this was a covenant promise to Israel under the, the Mosaic law. We have to understand that. <clears throat> when they followed his word, he would bless them. When they went against his word, he would curse them. Deuteronomy 28. Very clear. But the principle still does apply for us today. When we do what God says, he will help us. When we go against him, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Because he will discipline us as his children. And spankings don't feel good, just in case you're wondering. But what, what way does he bless us today? How can he bless us? Well, that's up to him. He chooses the way to bless us. Could be a blessing in business. You know, could be a blessing in one's family. Could be you gain wisdom. That is a blessing in itself. Uh, could be a restored relationship. Uh, could be financially. Could be, you know, you've been praying for this for so long, and the Lord just opens that door and you say, okay, now I know which way to go. Now I know which way to go. It could be freedom from guilt. You know what else, though? It could be pain. It could be some problems. Well, I didn't sign up for this, Lord. It could be loss. You say, well, how can that be a blessing? Well, from God's perspective, that could be a blessing. Because he's training us and teaching us and molding us into the image of Christ where we're most blessed to become like him. He decides. He knows what's best. So that is the blessed individual. Now we come to the wicked. Verses 4 and 5. These again are a contrast to the righteous or the godly. The wicked or the ungodly. Now this individual wants nothing to do with God. Nothing. They do not meditate on God's word. They care nothing for him, nor his law, nor his covenant. Now, some may give lip service, by the way. 
somebody give lip service. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that's great. They claim they care, but in their hearts, they're still evil and hate God. There's a simile to describe them, too. In contrast to the strong tree, the ungodly are like useless chaff. You say, well, what is chaff? I've got a picture here. <clears throat> this is an agricultural term. Uh, when the harvest came, someone would take the grain to a winnowing floor. Usually in Israel, it was a little bit higher, up on a, a hill or something like that, where the wind would be blowing gently. And what they would do, they would toss up the grain, toss up uh, the wheat or whatever it was, and those little particles, itty bitty particles, those little things right there, would be blown away in the wind. Useless. Good for nothing, we would say. That was called chaff. Now, they could collect some of those and start a fire, but they'd be burned like that. So again, they're really good for nothing. And the psalmist says the wicked are like chaff. Wow. Chaff in Scripture is most often used as a reference for the wicked individual or the wicked nations against Israel, against God. Now, this is what God is saying the wicked are like. This is not an insult. You're not being in kind, but it's the truth. In God's eyes, those who are against him, what's going to happen to them? They're going to burn forever in the lake of fire. That's where, they're, that's where they're going to go when they die. They don't love him, though he does love them. This is what God says the wicked are like, because they've rejected him, they've rejected his word, they've rejected his law, they've rejected his covenant, and in our world, then they rejected Christ. This is one reason why we need to be telling others about Jesus so they can come to know him in a saving way. So when we talk to somebody who is an intellectual, again, with you know, this many letters behind his or her name, or for those maybe in school watching, your professor in college, and who's like, oh, God, Bible, that's been disproved so many times. The Bible's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It's not really, it's, it's myth. That's a foolishness. That's a fool saying that. Because he's rejected God and his word. So no matter how intelligent this individual seems to be, remember what God says. They don't know him. And they need to know him. And we need to tell them about him. What they do with him is up to them. Pray for them. And tell them their only hope is in Jesus. Now, the psalmist says, the wind will drive the unrighteous away again like chaff. Again, that, that's the picture there. They will be blown away in God's wrath, in God's judgment. Therefore, because of this, the wicked will not stand in the judgment or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Basically, they're going to be punished by God, whom they rebelled against. They don't trust him. They don't know him. They don't love him. But unfortunately, he's still the one who's going to judge them. Again, I like what the Net Bible says here. I've got a quote. Quote, Hebrew, the judgment. This, the article indicates a judgment that is definite in the mind of the speaker. In the immediate context, this probably does not further a final judgment, <clears throat> described in later biblical revelation, but a temporal historical judgment which the author anticipates. Periodically during the Old Testament period, God would come in judgment, removing the wicked from the scene while preserving a godly remnant. Think of Pharaoh in Egypt. Think of Noah in the flood. That's a picture here. Now, of course, it would apply to God's final judgment, but here is probably talking about what they would be seeing. And ultimately, sadly, in the next life too. And in parallel form, the wicked will not join or take part in the covenant blessings of the congregation of the righteous. So again, the righteous follow what God says, the wicked does not. They are the opposite in both in life and in death. They cannot partake of God's blessing but only face his cursing. This word congregation or assembly refers to the nation of Israel in context here. Probably is what it refers to that here, 
or it could be a, a reference to a group or remnant within Israel, that faithful remnant possible there too. Either way, the righteous are protected from God's judgment. And for those of us in Christ, we're protected from his judgment too, from his wrath. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. I know I am. Why? Because Jesus died in our place. And today, though again we're not under law, those who reject Christ are already under God's judgment. That's what Jesus said in John 3. Mm -hmm. All of us are wicked in our hearts. Every human is a sinner, and we've all missed the mark of God's perfect holiness. So no matter how good someone thinks he or she is, they're nowhere near God's perfection. Only Christ, who gives us the righteousness of God, in Him, can we come to Him, can we trust Him, and be pure in God's sight. So be thankful we're not under the law, by the way. Though it's good, it is helpful, we should study it, we should understand it, take it seriously, it is important, and it's still God's word. Now last, verse six, the Lord. The Lord. Again, this is all in caps. So as, as you studied, I want to remind us, this is God's covenant-keeping personal name, Yahweh, or Jehovah. He made covenant promises in the law, and he's keeping them in this all for blessing and for cursing. He says that he knows the way of the righteous. Now, this is not just a general sense. Oh, I know, I know that. No, this is a specific sense of deep care or concern. He knows what's on our hearts. He knows what's, what path that we take. He cares about where we're going. He knows where those who know him are going. Which again was a covenant promise. The Lord not only knows our hearts, but he knows the direction of our lives. He knows the path that we're walking on. And he knows the bumps in that path. He knows the, the open areas and the, the wonderful sunshine that's going to be there too. He also knows the times when we walk through those dark valleys or the... the uh, Forest where there's a lot of scary stuff taking place. He knows those things. He will take care of us in those. If we have that relationship, relationship with God in Christ, he takes care of us on our journey along that path. <coughs> we may not do it the way we want or in the time we want, in the way we hope, and sooner or later we will die, but he will take care of us on that. So what direction are we taking? What path are we on personally? Where are we going? What's our goal? What road are we on? Are we taking God's road? The road of the world? Or our own? Something to consider. Now, yes, we make decisions. We have desires that we follow. We pray. We seek the Lord. And doing that, you know, his road overlaps ours. And in many ways, this is kind of what I want us to talk about for a second. That's the will of God. Now, personally, I do not believe God's will is a pinpoint where if you miss it, your life is over. I don't believe that for a moment. Now, I do believe there's some things he wants us to do, some things he's called us to do, opportunities he gives to us that we can choose or not choose, and, of course, be discouraged if we refuse those. And there are consequences to disobedience, but there's freedom in the Lord. You know, he, you know, we can choose what job to have, as long as it's appropriate, of course. You know, choose what food to eat, what places to go. We have that kind of freedom. But at the same time, again, there's things the Lord says. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, his will for our life, sanctification. His will for us has more to do with our character and our walk with him and our relationship with him than it does about where we live or what car we drive. Or what job we have, or what school we go to. Now, all those are important, and we should seek the Lord. Don't get me wrong. But enjoy the blessings that God has given to you. Please enjoy those. I think as Christians, we sometimes forget that. You know, we get so wrapped up in so many other things. You know, and, and sometimes God's will includes pain and problems, by the way, too. 
but enjoy the blessings that God's given to you as best as you can. Now, real quick, back to the text. In contrast and in, in summary, <coughs> the way of the wicked will perish. The direction, the journey, the path they're on leads to them, leads them to destruction in this life and the next. And in poetic style wisdom literature, the righteous will be blessed by God, the unrighteous will be judged by God. Mm -hmm. That's the summary. It all goes back to the Lord. He knows. And the principle for us, God never promises us an easy life. But he does promise to be there with us in this life. And in Christ, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, Peter says. We have forgiveness. We have his righteousness. We have his love. We are adopted. We are his child. And we cannot lose that. Think about this phrase. I heard about this years ago. The worst a Christian will have it is in this life. Listen, listen close. The worst a Christian will have it is in this life. Amen. The best a non-Christian will have it is in this life. Mm. The best a non-Christian will have it is in this life. Because eternity is a very, very, very long time. So where do we walk? Where do we stand? Where do we sit? And with whom do we converse with and get our advice from? What is our spiritual condition? What do we think of the Bible? Or do we think of the Bible? Is another way to say it too. Do we know the God who wrote the Bible? If not, the only way is to come through Jesus by faith. That is the only way. Not by works, not by baptism, not by church service, not by joining anything or anyone. Not because you're the, the son or the daughter of a pastor or a deacon or an elder. Only by faith in Jesus. So do you know him by faith? If you do, have you been biblically baptized? That's the next question. After salvation. And if not, you need to be. Out of obedience. It doesn't save you, but it is a step of obedience. And it's also a picture of the salvation that God has given you in Christ. And are you part of a local fellowship? If not, you should be. And consider committing to Grace Life about that too. As your church home. And by the way, if you're watching this, come and visit. Uh, if you have questions, go to our website, www.gracelifenow.com. Or .org, I'm sorry. Uh, look at our Facebook page, our Twitter page. Look at those. You can email us, info at gracelifenow.org. Is there anybody here for those who are watching? Because questions often do come up. And sometimes we do get questions, which is a good thing. So email us, uh, talk to somebody, you know, talk to another pastor who knows this stuff. So as we finish up today, as we close, as we briefly study Psalm 1, what's the Lord working in your heart? Maybe learning to delight in his word. And I thought about this as I was doing the study for this. Very short. To delight in his word is to delight in him. To delight in God's word is to delight in him. Maybe he wants us to grow our roots into scripture more. Do some more study. Reading, memorizing, meditating on his word more. Learning to fit some of those pieces together in some of those difficult passages. But whatever he's worked in your life, move forward with that. Move forward with that. So with that, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our Lord God, we praise you, we thank you. As we look a little bit at the background of the Psalms, the structure, and then Psalm 1. We see some wonderful truth there. So Lord, help us to delight in you and to delight in your word. Yes. We do ask for your blessing, however you choose to do it. We do ask for opportunities to share Christ with others so that they will no longer be without him. 
And Father, as we finish up today, may your word pierce our hearts. May you make the change in us that you want to make. As we look at the beauty of your word, may we understand the beauty of who you are. As we understand that you are one who keeps his promises, help us to remember the promises that you gave to Israel and that you've also given to us. You will never leave us or forsake us. You've forgiven us completely. We are yours forever. So Lord, let us build our lives on your word, to build our thinking, to have our emotions in line with your word too. And Father, when we do struggle, when we do have questions, remind us that we too can be like that tree, planted firmly in your word, drinking from the pure living waters of your word and of your spirit. Because we need you so much in our lives. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. <coughs> and help us to be rooted in your truth for your glory. In the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have coming events, of course, we do have Sunday school, uh, 9.30 to about 10.15, except for the second Sunday when we have break in, or I mean breakfast. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study, we do have our new series that we're still going on, Defining Christianese. So hopefully you can make that. 6.30 to about 7.30. And then uh, January 24th, this coming Thursday, I'm also teaching at Zion, so please pray for that. Uh, please pray for that. And again, I'll be meeting with Dan 